It's about time I got around to beating a dead horse. This episode I'll be debunking the wage gap. It's a wonder anyone still buys this myth at all. As with all myths, there is a kernel of truth that has been widely misrepresented. That truth? When taking into account all working women in the U.S. versus all working men, women on average earn 9% less. The misrepresentation is that women are disadvantaged in the workplace or are somehow paid less through some nebulous form of gender discrimination. It's important to remember in cases regarding discrimination, individual data is responsible for group disparity. Men and women are different. The disparity isn't just socially constructed because they're universal across human cultures and have clear biological causes and links to testosterone. To explain the success of a certain group over another group, we have only to look at a simple statistical phenomenon. Men and women are different. They are two distinct subgroups of people. As such, suppose we have two normal distributions. One represents the success of men and the other of women. If the two are not identical, as is reality when comparing any two distinct groups, the vast majority will overlap. But when we look at the extremes, like the 95th percentile, we'll notice that those people are much more likely to be from the male group than from the female group. That isn't sexism, that's statistics. The distribution may not be precisely equal, but it is fair. The truth is, the American professional culture as a whole is a meritocracy. Those who work the best and the most are most likely to succeed. Women on average do not work as much as men do. This comes all down to differences between men and women in the decisions we make on average in regards to those differences. Women are less likely to be employed in highly competitive jobs, and not for lack of incentive. Top-paying companies stick their neck out as far as possible to entice women employees to work for them. Women tend to choose jobs that pay less. Men account for 97% of on-the-job deaths because women don't usually risk their lives for fishing, logging, roofing, policing, mining, garbage collection, trucking, construction, welding, installing power lines. All of those jobs pay exorbitantly well, but come at a risk that women are on average not willing to take. For all this talk about equality, why don't we see a push to get women into more of those types of roles? If true equality is what we're searching for, we need that female work-related death percentage to increase tenfold. In the name of equality, that must change. As soon as you bring this argument up, it becomes apparent modern feminists aren't actually searching for equality. They certainly don't call for women to work more hours. On average, they work 175 hours less per year. That's excluding all of the unemployed or stay-at-home women. If you include those women, that number would be brought up to over 1,000 hours less per year. Women, on average, have more openness towards feelings and aesthetics rather than ideas. Women generally have stronger interest in people rather than things. That can be also interpreted as empathizing versus systemizing. These two differences in part explain why women relatively prefer jobs in social or artistic areas. More men may enjoy engineering because it requires systemizing. We often ask why we don't see women in top leadership positions, but never ask why we see so many men in these jobs. Status. 
is the primary metric that men are judged on, pushing many men into higher paying, less satisfying jobs in the pursuit of status. There are more men on both the top and bottom of the curve. This leads to more male CEOs and geniuses, but also way more homeless males and school dropouts. Each individual must be given fair treatment by the system. Group disparities should not matter. We can have a discussion about what factors may be causing groups to underperform, but that is not the fault of a fair system. How do we know the system is fair? A bevy of federal laws are intended to protect workers against job discrimination based on a number of classifications. Those laws include Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that prohibits discrimination according to race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and the Equal Pay Act of 1963 meant to protect men and women who perform equal work from wage discrimination based on gender. If a company were to break any of these laws, they would be sued, and their customer base would forsake them. It simply is not in the interest of a capitalist corporation to take that kind of risk. As it may be apparent now, multivaried analysis of the pay gap indicates that it does not exist. If you are a scientist worth your salt, you would never do a univaried analysis. In fact, in 147 out of 150 of the largest cities in the U.S., the median full-time salaries of young women are 8% higher than those of equally qualified men who had the same education level and time in the field. The wage gap narrative is fundamentally misleading and economically illogical. The earnings gap is solely dependent on choice and biology, not discrimination. I think I successfully provided examples for why eliminating the gap could not be just at the cost of men, but at the cost of women too. Because it may interfere with some other choices women choose, that is, besides salary, maybe like safety, or like family, or social or artistic careers, like a better work-life balance. Equal outcomes is a terrible social goal, and it is impossible to achieve. So what do the feminists want? Legally, they have equality, and socially, women are respected and receive far more attention than men. With the new laws on executive boardroom quotas, I'd even argue that they have achieved systemic legal gender discrimination in their favor. For almost a half century now, the feminists have been open about no longer fighting for equality, and instead for gender supremacy. At this point, feminism has devolved into a cynical political tool for power and votes. Twice as many Democrats compared to Republicans identify to some degree as feminist. Feminism has become an international, multi-billion dollar industry receiving billions in taxpayer money from the U.S. A large proportion of those taxpayer funds are spent on women-only initiatives that spread misandry and misinformation to support female supremacy. There is no equivalent political organization for men, with billions in funding to represent the issues men face, and as a result, feminists have succeeded in changing laws to create double standards that favor women and are biased against men. They have also succeeded in controlling the public narrative that paints all men as potential predators, abusers, and oppressors, while painting women as victims. Women even have near universal access to the so-called right to abortion, if you ever discuss with an abortion advocate, it's almost always a bad faith discussion. First, half of women disagree with abortionists. And no, pro-lifers don't want to control your body. They want to prevent the murdering of the innocent. If the conversation were honest, we could get to the core of the issue, which is and always has been, are you killing a human life? If you aren't, then what is it? When does it become a human life? And under what circumstances is it okay to kill the child? Or whatever it is that isn't a human life. If feminism were a serious movement, the entire focus would be on women who legitimately don't have equal rights in non-Western countries like Saudi Arabia. But shh. 
You can't criticize brown people for fear of being labeled an intolerant bigot racist. Thanks for watching.